and the chant on goodwill. One of the phrases is, may all beings be free from animosity. Awira is the Pali. And it's important to understand what this animosity means. It's a particular kind of animosity. It comes when someone has beaten you, either at a game or at war or in any kind of contest, where one side wins and the other side loses, or one side has been behaving unfairly, and the loser wants to get back, settle the score. And that state of mind that animates the person who lost, that's wera. And from there it goes into a type of relationship between both sides. Both sides have wera, the, the target. What usually happens is both sides tend to target each other, especially when you think about the long course of time in samsara. There's been a lot of back and forth. And there's some particular relationships that get pretty nasty this way, that you focus on and you've got to get back at this person. This animosity contains a, not a small touch of revenge. And of course, this feeling does not lead to any kind of happiness. And so one of the purposes of our practice is to get beyond wera, get beyond animosity. And first we do that by forgiveness. Recently there was an article that came out saying that in the teaching on karma there's no room for forgiveness because you're not in anybody's debt. And so nobody has the right to say that you're indebted to them and they have the right to call back their debts. That's not really the case. When you've wronged somebody, there's an innate sense in a lot of us where you've got to get back at the person who wronged you. And when you forgive someone, okay, you basically renounce your rights to that. And at the same time, you're saying you pose no danger to that person. You don't have to love the person, but just you pose no danger. You're not going to try to get back. And as the Buddha said, it's only through non wera non-animosity, the animosity is, is ended and grows still. And this can help both sides. To begin with, you are no longer tied in that kind of relationship. No matter what the person may do to you, you're not going to react. This attitude of non wera attitude of forgiveness, is also one of restraint, just as goodwill is a form of restraint. Then it may happen that you set a good example for the other person, too. You're not taking up the battle. They may decide, well, they won. Let them have their victory, realizing that it's not much of a victory. But then what do we do to substitute this sense of having been wronged? And this is where the Buddha proposes we start looking for happiness in other ways, in other words, areas in which there are no losers. Where everybody wins. It starts out with something very simple, generosity. It goes on through virtue and the practice of meditation. All of these are areas in which you gain happiness in a way that does not inf inflict any pain on anyone else. In fact, you can actually help them gain some happiness. When you're generous, you give a gift, you gain a sense of the magnanimous heart, which is a large open heart. And the other person receives something from you. And John Lee has a nice analogy. He says it's like squeezing the juice out of a fruit. You take the juice, and they get the re remaining pulp. That's for you to think to yourself. You don't tell that to the person who's received your gift. But it's for you to have no sense of that you've lost something or that you missed the gift. Because if you have that attitude, then you don't get the, the full rewards of the generosity. But both sides benefit. And the same with virtue. You're not harming anyone. You gain the 
the perfection of virtue, the other pers person or the people around you don't have to f be harmed by you in any way, which contributes to their happiness. And when you meditate, you're getting some control of your greed, aversion, and delusion. The other people don't have to be victims of your greed, aversion, and delusion. So you're looking for happiness the way that doesn't have any boundaries. It's not a case of you win and somebody else loses. Everybody wins. This is not like the happiness that is based on wealth or status or praise. Well, they have to be winners and losers. And in the sense of developing this kind of happiness that doesn't have any losers, you also change your sense of yourself. Yes, yourself. Our sense of self is basically a strategy for finding happiness. And if your happiness is the kind where you have to win out over people, it becomes a very unhealthy kind of self. Many of us come to Buddhism in hopes that we can get rid of our sense of self because we know that it's unskillful. But you can't get to the point of no self or not needing any sense of self unless you've straightened out your sense of self or the senses of self that you bring to your activities. And because your sense of self is defined by the kind of happiness you're looking for. The best way to develop a sense of self that is healthy is to look for happiness in ways that nobody's going to lose, when the happiness spreads around. This is why when people say, how do I develop the teaching on not self? One of the best ways to do it is learn to be generous, learn to be virtuous, in addition to meditating. Everybody focuses on the meditation in the hopes that they can see their unhealthy sense of self just dissolve away. But you need day-to-day -day practice in looking for a sense of happiness that harms no one, where there are no losers, only winners. That means you don't have to compare yourself with other people, that kind of conceit where you have to compare yourself with others. John Mahabo has a nice phrase. He says that it's the fangs of, un of ignorance. When you've got to beat out somebody else, we have to be more outstanding than other people, or more special than other people. Those are the fangs. Because you're looking for happiness in a way that's, if you think of it as a kind of a food, it's pretty miserable food. So instead, if you're going to find a sense of pride and honor, okay, find it in being skillful in your search for happiness, the way that harms no one. Think about the Buddha teaching Rahula. He said, look at your actions. Before you do something, ask yourself, are you going to harm anyone? If the action is going to harm them, you don't do it. If you don't see, foresee any harm, then you go ahead and do it. While you're doing it, look for the results that can come immediately sometimes, if there's any immediate harm that comes, you stop. If not, you keep on going. When the action is done, you look at the long-term results. And if you found out that even though you thought there was going to be no harm, there was harm, you resolve not to make that mistake again. Talk it over with someone who's more advanced in the path to get some ideas on how not to repeat the mistake. In other words, don't be so proud that you're not willing to admit your mistake to others. But when you look at your action, you see there was no harm. Again, you can take pride in the fact that a healthy sense of pride, in the fact that you're progressing on the path. Now remember, Rahula, like the Buddha, was raised in a noble warrior culture where the sense of honor was very strong. Here, the Buddha is redefining what honor means. It means not being a slave to your defilements, taking pride in the fact that you're harmless. All too often in the world now, when there's this doctrine of winners and losers, people take pride in winning no matter how they win. And then it creates a very unhealthy sense of self that's going to come around and harm them in the, in the long run. Or if you take pride in the fact that you're harmless and that you actually should be beneficial to the people around you and to yourself. 
Genesis is an honor that should be encouraged. So the Buddha is not teaching you to be totally humble in the sense of thinking there's no good to you at all. That's not the kind of humility the Buddha is looking for. His humility was in that the willingness to learn. You come to something, an activity or a situation, and you don't assume immediately that you know everything. You realize, I've got to learn here. And you show gratitude to the people who teach you. You don't assume that it's your entitlement. In this way, your sense of self loses a lot of its fangs. And as for the selves in your stable that do have fangs, you can put them out to pasture. You don't need them. Use the ones that are skillful. Learn to disidentify with all the selves that have been unskillful. Ultimately, of course, you get to the point where you don't need a sense of self because you found a happiness that doesn't need any more actions, doesn't need anything more to maintain it. And because your sense of self was a strategy, your sense of not self was a strategy for happiness. Both of them were strategies for happiness. You don't need either at that point. You let them both go. But in the meantime, you want to make sure that you're training yourselves in skillful activities, looking for a happiness that doesn't create divisions, that doesn't have winners or losers. Happiness where they're all winners, no losers. And that's when your sense of self, instead of being an unskillful strategy for happiness, in other words, finding happiness that has a lot of drawbacks, you can actually find that happiness is really good, trustworthy, reliable. And your self becomes trustworthy and reliable as well. That's the kind of self you can use in the path. It's like the raft. You hold on to it as you go across the river. When you get to the other side, that's when you let it go. But in the meantime, make sure the raft is good. And look for happiness in a way that doesn't divide the world into winners and losers. Let's everybody win.